Well, teaching is very much aligned with my life's mission. I find that a lot of my downtime is spent that are sort of recovering and resting. And it, I seem, I feel quite depleted at the end of the week. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to location. And because I'm thinking, like, I feel that maybe New York City is not the right place for me. How did you decide on Montana and L.A.? Um, my other question is, I find that I keep simplifying more and more. And I wonder, does it become clear when you finally reached enough? Or at some point, do you just say, this is good? Because I find that as I keep going deeper on this journey, I keep realizing, oh, I actually need less stuff. And it just feels like maybe I've become a little bit obsessed and my time is spent too much sort of finding new places to simplify. So, Ryan, she's a, a middle school teacher, and she talks about how that aligns with her life's mission. I think that differentiation, the, the, the word she used, whether it's intentional or not, she, she said it aligns with her life's mission, but mm. she didn't say it was her life's mission. And I think that's, that's a good uh, – she, she's recognizing something that m she has a, a life's mission. Maybe that's to contribute. Maybe that's to help kids. But there are different ways to do that. And maybe, mm -hmm. just maybe, it has nothing to do with the location that she's in. She's in New York City. Yeah. And, but she's also, it sounds to me like an introvert, like I am. Mm -hmm. I think you, it's perfectly okay. It's fine to be an introvert in the city. Although, it it's may, I find a lot of introverts prefer to be in crowded cities. Yeah. I wonder, like for you, uh, who is, you know, high introvert, what is it about uh, a tight, tightly packed city that makes you feel like you can still be introverted but right. yeah well it, it why is it appealing i guess it's appealing to me because well it's what i call ambient people having mm. access to people and, and and so the ability to connect although there's another type of of introvert and they tend to be older men mm. living in montana or alaska where like literally they'll live by themselves and not see people for weeks at a time they right? wouldn't yeah they would never live in la or new york or right right I exactly and, and they don't even want the potential for interaction in fact that's what sort of turns them away from cities is they don't want that potential they don't want to be bothered and while i don't necessarily want to be bothered either i think i have the right to be left alone i i want i want the ability to be able to to connect with other people if need be. And that's one of the, been one of the great things about living in Los Angeles for me mm -hmm. is we have met so many new people where I have access to them. I don't have to see them every single day, but mm -hmm. if I have a friend who I you know, have coffee with once a quarter, then that's great. Yeah. I have that access. A lot of to people them. come through here too, which is really cool. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's, that, that's a, that's a great point because you're living somewhere where you have access to other people when they come through here. Not a lot of people were coming through Missoula, Montana when we lived there. Yeah. I mean, occasionally, and then of course we would like spend time with them but it's so weird i would always offer people to come out to missoula montana which for me like that's like if i was given the option to go to montana and had a place to stay in the mountains like i would do everything i could yeah to get out there because i mean it is just like that's that's my paradise you know yeah uh not many people took me up on that offer right but it when i threw that offer in la mm -hmm. dude i, I it's funny because like within the first two or three months <laughs> I had to like scale it back and be like oh like like everyone's now taking me up on this offer to stay at my place yeah you I'm rescinding the <laughs> offer <laughs> right retroactively but I think a lot of it has to do with like people do just pa I mean LA is a hub so uh it, people mm -hmm. come here often Missoula is a is a destination it's not really a a, a hub of, of sorts yeah and in California but but Southern California and and LA especially I mean it's a world city right mm -hmm. and so there's something like 12 million people in the county, 20 million people in the in the metro area. So you can also find people who align with what your preferences and hobbies and everything. I mean, you've yeah. met friends who you go surfing with now. Yeah. I don't have those same friends because I don't I don't go surfing. It's not that I have any judgment against that person, but like it's it's in fact a, a good friend of mine, Andre. Um, uh, you know, Andre, he went to a comedy store with us a yeah, few yeah. weeks ago. Um, he's like, hey, do you and Bex want to go out with me and, and, and my girl for 
you know, like a board game night. And I'm like, no, of course I don't want to. <laughs> like uh, how miserable. <laughs> right, right. But but it, it's also being honest about what my preferences are. And that's, I think, where we are with Sarah right now is she is being on, she's starting to be honest with herself about what her preferences are. Mm-hmm. I remember being in the corporate world to make this analogous to what she, to, to, to her professional career. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was in the corporate world, I had I had to be an extrovert almost all day, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, managing people, leading teams of people, interacting with customers, no matter what my role was, even when I was just a, a sort of frontline salesman in a retail store, all the way up to being a director of a bunch of retail stores, I had to interact with people 24 hours a day. Mm-hmm. Now, part of that aligned with the person I wanted to be because I did want to lead people. I wanted to help people. I wanted to add value to people's lives. And maybe 20% of what I was doing allowed me to do that. But the mm-hmm. other 80% did not actually align with the person I wanted to become. And I think that's where maybe Sarah is right now. She, it's I don't know that it's the city. It could be the city. Yeah. And the only way you'll know is to try out a different city. It uh, doesn't mean you have to do it for a long period of time um i just had our friend nate nate green is moving i mean he he we did that breakup podcast with him yep. 148 yeah and now he's he's been living in montana for you know a while and yeah. they're in portland he's like trying to figure out like what's his next step and so he and i did a living room conversation together uh on youtube shout out to youtube audience hey y'all um and uh when we were on living room conversations, he's testing something out for the next year. He's going to, he's moving to, um, he's moving somewhere overseas in Asia. And then after oh, he's going to, uh, Thailand, right? Yeah. yeah but it's a specific part hey. where there's a, uh, um, he's doing, he's doing some sort of, uh, uh meditation and yeah. it's close to a particular community. Yeah, man. Um, and then he's got, I think he's, he's probably going to go to Croatia for six months after that. Oh, Croatia. A- and, uh, and then after that, he's not really sure where he's going to be. And I think that's the nice thing. So Sarah asked, how did you choose Montana? How did you choose Los Angeles? Yeah, it was, it's funny, man. When we went on that tour, our very first tour was what, uh, 2011. Yeah. Like the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And we did, uh, basically, uh, you know, 75, the highway, <laughs> 75, we, we went down to Florida and then we, you know, Tennessee, stuff that you and I have seen a million times. Yeah, but yeah. then we started to branch out and go to like Chicago mm-hmm. or Phoenix or Portland or LA. And I just remember having that feeling that you were talking about earlier before uh, we got into these questions about how uh, you just want to run from mm-hmm. Dayton, Ohio, because, well, I think when you're raised somewhere, uh, everything gets a little bit, I don't want to say boring, but you, you want a change of scenery. Yeah. In Dayton, Ohio, um, you know, the, it is a beautiful place. Don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, I was like, all right, no more cornfields, uh, you know, no more allergies. <laughs> I want to like get out and see some awesome scenery or like be in a cool city. Right. And every city we went to, man, I was just like, oh, Portland's awesome. Let's move to Portland. Yes. You remember me like constantly saying every like, place San we Francisco. Went. No, dude, we should move to San Francisco. <laughs> in fact, I was looking at, at, and this was back in what, 2012. I was looking, or 20, yeah, 2011, 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, I was looking at places to live in San Francisco. So I was like, okay, that sounds good. Yeah. And I started looking and it's like $4,000 for a studio apartment. And that was back then. It's even worse now. Yeah. Uh, we just did Kevin Rose's show. And that's one of the reasons he left San Francisco was like the crazy skyrocketing prices of, of everything. And that's something else you have to keep in mind. She lives in Brooklyn right now. Mm-hmm. Imagine how the, the cost of living in New York City or we're in LA, the cost of living here I was just having this conversation with our friend Amy from from Google, or mm-hmm. formerly from from Google. She went to go work for a nonprofit, but um, and, and and one of the things you have to keep in mind that the reason that that uh, L.A. is a hard city to to live in is because the cost of living is astronomical. Yeah. Um. The the article I I just saw Richard Florida I believe did the study, and Sean, if I could find this, I'll send it to you and we could put it in the show notes. But Richard Florida did the study of of. Um, how much it costs for an apartment in Soho in, in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. You could buy over a hundred houses in Toledo or Dayton. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, so the average house in, in, in Soho. Yeah. The average equals, apartment. equals over a hundred homes. Average cost of, wow, that's unbelievable homes. That is unbelievable. Yeah. yeah I think you could do 70 in, in, in Detroit and, 
uh, 100 in Youngstown. Wow. I mean, uh, it, and what was fascinating is cost of living has to be uh, has to play a major factor, and that was one of the the things that allowed me to. And we're going to talk about this, I think, with Javier's question coming up next. But but uh, the cost of living in Dayton allowed me to pay off my debt. It would have been much harder in a city like Los Angeles for me to become completely debt free because right. I, by definition, I'm going to spend more money on on just my my bare essentials yeah, right keeping a roof over your head keeping yourself fed <laughs> the yeah. average house in los angeles not not just the nice places like silver lake or or los Feliz or west hollywood or mm-hmm. venice the average house in all of la is approaching six hundred thousand dollars in god cost. it's unbelievable and and you know you, you go to a place like dayton you can get a nice house for sixty thousand dollars not yeah. an outstanding six hundred thousand dollars in dayton will get you a mansion it, it'll get like, you look at the, the the beverly hills equivalent times two you can yeah. probably buy two God. beverly hills houses in in dayton that's so crazy you know it's funny like as we're talking about this i'm asking myself like why did we move to la again <laughs> <laughs> but you know honestly man like because of the podcast and right. uh the, the projects that we're working on like this really is the place to be right now for us right um to, key words right now yeah right now and you know i look at it um like an investment Mm. The the cost of living, it is, yes, way higher than most places in, in the U.S., right. but I don't look at it as like a waste of money. I don't look at it as like um, anything other than an investment that, that Mariah and I, not just with our money, but our time too. So, it, it, you know, just to Sarah's point, like she's got to look at, you know, when she moves to uh a, another place, um, is it, yeah, if, if, she, if she needs to save some money, great, but saving money isn't always the, the, the right reason to pick a place or not. Right. Although I wouldn't have moved to LA if we were in debt. No. And, and, and because it would be more difficult to pay off that debt. Yeah. So let's talk uh, real quick about, so, so you sort of illuminated why we moved to LA. That's a place where people go to tell well, stories. Do you want to talk about Montana first? Why we moved to Montana yeah, first? Yeah, yeah, okay. that, that's that. I think that's a better starting point. So okay. we were in Dayton, Ohio. We did this 33 city tour with our first book, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. I wanted to move to every single city all that we went to, cities. all 33 cities. Well, 32 others. It was Dayton and 32 others. <laughs> but yeah, every time we were there, I mean, I remember being in Knoxville and we were yeah, like, man, Knoxville's pretty hip yeah. yeah it was great and i <laughs> still was. like knoxville right um and and what i started to realize is oh i can be happy anywhere oh yeah it, it's we don't hate change we hate being changed mm-hmm. but we, when we implement change on our own we actually look forward to that right and, and that's yeah. why looking at those cities now if someone were to tell you ryan if all of a sudden you would have been told uh, Hey, you have to move to Knoxville. You'd be like, "What? Why?" <laughs> I'd be like, "No." Why? But I wouldn't. But, I wouldn't like to be forced to move anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, what we like is our ability to have control over our own change. When people say, "I hate change," I think they're wrong because if their bank account changes seven figures in the positive, all of a sudden they're going to be like, "Yeah, I like that change." Right. Well, what we mean is we hate being changed. We hate unexpected change. We hate changes that are thrust upon us. So. Sarah's in a good position right now because she's looking for elsewhere. So if she decides to stay in Brooklyn, then she can make that decision on her own. So why, why did we move out to Montana? Man, um, Missoula. What? <laughs> yeah. So, God, man, I don't know where to start. I mean, I guess. How about this? We we were dry. We were at the very end of the tour. The thirty third city was Vancouver, BC. Yeah, we were finishing it up, driving through Montana, and before we got to Montana, it was it was late. And we were like, you know, we were in Idaho. We were like, you know what? We're just going to stop here in Idaho. Yeah. We're going to spend the night and then we're going to get up tomorrow and just like barrel through Montana and right. get it and get it over with. We'd never been to Montana. Never, 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 never even thought about Montana. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, we stopped in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho and they, you know, one of the charges like 250 bucks a night for a hotel room, which was crazy. I was we're like, like, we're in the panhandle of Idaho. We're in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, dude, there's no one in your parking lot right now. Yeah. Like, I don't understand. And he did lower it. Like, I think, he, you know, it was like 200 bucks or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was saying, he was just telling me, he's like, dude, he's like, this is a really nice place. He's like, uh, you know, basically trying to explain to me why it was so expensive. Well, when we woke up in the morning and saw the beauty of Coeur d'Alene, it was like, oh, mm-hmm. like this is why that's 200 bucks a night because it's like a very, very gorgeous, one of the most gorgeous places uh, th- that I've been to in this country, honestly. Um, and then we started driving into Montana that morning. Yeah. And it was just, 
I don't want to say it was more beautiful or less as much as it was just different beauty around every corner. It, it, for me, it literally was more beautiful. Like we were in, in, in Idaho, and as soon as you cross that that line in the Montana, <laughs> for some some reason, it's like it's picturesque. Yeah. And then we hit that spot. There's this tiny little waterfall right off of I ninety. Well, we, before that, though, we stopped to get coffee in, in Missoula. In Missoula, Montana. And what was crazy about Missoula um, was a we found awesome coffee, uh-huh. and we found awesome fish tacos. And like, yes. so th- those are two things that when we go to a city, that's what we kind of consider is right. like, um, how, how good is the food? Yeah. Uh, can you get some decent food and you know, not like sit down restaurant food, but yeah. just like they didn't have a Chipotle. I mean, that's, I mean, they have one now, but when we first moved there, they didn't have a Chipotle. That was right. almost a game breaker or a, you know, game changer, except they had good fish tacos. And it's like, all right, all right, we can do fish tacos instead of Chipotle. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, I remember just going to, um, oh no, is it La Petite? Yeah, yeah, La Petite. I was like, I forget the name of the place. Le, Le Petite. Le Petite. Yeah, we went to Le Petite, Missoula, Montana. Which, by the way, awesome bakery, awesome coffee. If you're in Missoula, Montana, definitely go to La, uh, Le Petite. Um, but I remember the barista waiting on us, and you know, because like I have this like this inner hippie in me. Uh-huh. I just remember like seeing the people working there, and like, hey, they were so nice, dude. Like that's the one thing about Montana, about Missoula, is that people don't look at me. Like I'm weird. Mm. Like when I go up to someone, hey, how's it going? Like they give me the same energy back. Yeah. There's no like they. There's not a people don't have a lot of uh, a lot of walls up in in Missoula. I feel like. Yeah. Um. You go up to someone in Dayton, Ohio, or Los Angeles. Hey, I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and they're gonna look at you like, all right, dude. Okay, what do you want? What What's up? Like you know, like they'd be a little bit trepidatious. Where in Missoula, you go up to someone, hey, I'm Ryan Nicodemus. They're like, okay, you're cool until you prove me otherwise. Right, right, right. So, I, so like, I loved that feeling. But then also, dude, I remember thinking to myself, I could probably find a drum circle here. <laughs> like, it'd be <laughs> really easy to find a drum. Now, I never was in a drum circle. Actually, that's not true. Uh, Mariah's mom, uh, they do uh, a couple drum circles a year. And I was like, there was one of them that I was in. It was kind of fun. But, but I, you know, for all intents and purposes, like, I, that was the only drum circle I was ever in in five years right, in Missoula. So, so, so we left, we, we left Le Petit, we got our coffee, we hit the road again, we're on yeah. I-90 and, uh, and then all of a sudden there's this little waterfall off the side of, uh, off the side of the highway and it looked like someone was filming an Abercrombie and Fitch ad. It was there just were, like, dudes with raging six packs like chicks and thongs it was no, it was skinny dipping right and oh. so like there were six college kids four women two men and they were jumping into this little sort of hot spring waterfall thing on the side of the highway it's the first time in my life i've ever done a triple take and as i looked over and this is not made up a bald eagle flew overhead yeah and it, it, the only thing more American is if they would have been like waving some sort of uh, uh, American flag or the eagle had it in his talons or something. Mm-hmm. And and what I realized, like, oh, like this is what advertisements try to affect is what's going on right here in Montana today. Now, granted, it was it was mid July, early July of 2012, and. Which, by the way, is the absolute perfect time oh, to yeah, be in Montana. Oh, yeah, we got so lucky when we were passing through, man. There's two solid months of weather, sometimes only one solid month of weather a year in Montana, and in Missoula specifically. Um, and and it was like the perfect time. So gorgeous weather, 85 degrees, skinny dipping, beautiful college kids. I've never seen a bald eagle in my life. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. We don't have many bald eagles there unless they're on currency. <laughs> or in a zoo. It, right. <laughs> and, and so we sort of looked at each other and you're like, Hey, we should come back out here to write the next book. Yeah. So for me, it was the community. Uh huh. It was, uh, access to the, the basic preferences that I had. Yes. Um, good coffee, good fish tacos. Yeah. Um, good pizza. Although I don't eat pizza anymore. God, I miss pizza, <laughs> especially with pineapple on it. So but anyway, what, what, what's different <laughs> about Missoula? I mean, you can get, those things pretty much anywhere you can go to saskatoon and find good coffee and and good people yeah yeah so what what i was getting to is uh just the community in general um i that's what really drew me to missoula not only that but sweeping mountains Mm -hmm. awesome views um and then you know kind of totally romanticizing this writer in a cabin on yeah. the side of a mountain. Which is what we did for four yeah, months. We yeah. first moved out there. It was October 3rd, 2012. I remember I arrived there a week before you did. Yeah. And the day I got there, it was snowing. And I don't In mean October. just... Yeah, <laughs> early October. Dude, Mariah and, and I left for LA in September. Uh-huh. And we drove here. It was snowing. 
on the way. It was like the last snow. Anyway, it was like on. blizzardy too, yeah, right? I mean, it, and so getting there, I'm like, oh, this is different from what I remember back in July. And so we rented this cabin in the middle of nowhere from Craigslist, and uh, we just wrote and 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 spent those four months. Uh, creating our book, Everything That Remains. Mm -hmm. But then we found ourselves gravitating toward Missoula, which was two hours away. Mm -hmm. uh, we lived in this uh, little, you know, uh, it was Phillipsburg, Montana. There's one traffic light and in, in, uh, 3,400 square miles. Um, but if you really wanted to go to a city, you either went to Butte or you went to Missoula. And we found ourselves gravitating toward Missoula. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of that, we, we decided, hey, let's actually move to this city. There's 70,000 people there. It's it's not a, a massive city, but it feels much more like yeah. a city because it's, it's dense because it's built in between those mountain ranges. Yeah, Colin also wanted uh, to live with us too. Yeah, So, so our, this is kind of what spawned us really making this move colin was like man let's get together live together for six months let's see what kind of creations we can make and you know we uh it was time for us to graduate from from that small uh little town yeah and, so, so we yeah. went into it only planning to be in that cabin for four months and uh, let's see let's see what's going to happen we didn't have a well, let's move here for the rest of our lives and i think that's quite often the mentality we get into I, and we we get it becomes much more difficult to make a decision if, if the decision is I have to make this decision and stick with it for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. It's way easier when you're like, hey, I'm going to give myself four months here because you can do four months anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, Colin wanted to come out because we were starting a, a publishing house together, Asymmetrical Press. And so we set up shop together, the three of us in Missoula, Montana. Yeah. And then we ended up both meeting the loves of our lives in, in, in Montana and, and sticking around there for about five years. As a result, I will say this though: you and I differ on Missoula because for me, I didn't find my my community there. Yeah, um, and it was really difficult. I, I remember being like, "Oh, like I still feel this attachment to Dayton because that was where my community was, and I was unable to find the the right people for me in Missoula." So, um, I guess yeah, talk about what is a uh, what is community to you? Meaning, so for me, when I say community, it's like I, Missoula, Montana, I feel like is the only place I could ever live and accidentally fall into the main role of a play. Right. <laughs> I mean, I was at a game night. Yeah. And uh, next thing I know, I'm like, you know, got the lead role in this in this play. And then I was able to make some friends from there. So for me, it's, um, I guess it's acceptance, really. It's like a community that... I, I agree with that. I, so... I never felt accepted in, in Missoula. Really? By and large. Mm. Yeah, there's obvious differences. I mean, I met Bex out there. And yeah. so obviously... I felt accepted by her, but and 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 by you and by a few other people whom I met. You know, our friend Nate Green, we we, we met in in Missoula, Montana. And so there were there are, there was a handful yeah. of people, but it was ne I, so I agree with you. Acceptance is part of it. I think preferences are another part of it. Yeah. Desires, having similar desires as people in the community, mm. and so I did. There, there weren't a lot of type threes. You know, the Enneagram type three mm. a, achievers in mm. Missoula, Montana. Oh, I. I, it, maybe I don't agree with yeah. that. I, the reason why I say that though is because one thing about community for me too is how involved are people in the community? How well do they treat their community? And Missoula is tight knit. Mm -hmm. Not only that, there are some very, very famous people, producers, directors, writers, um, uh, uh, you know, old talent agent. Like there's a ton mm -hmm. of talent in Missoula. Well, there aren't a ton the, of people uh, there. I think <clears throat> is, is the, and so like, it was more difficult because I'm an introvert and I spend way less time. You know, you, you and I talk about the three the three concentric circles of relationship. You have your mm -hmm. primary relationships, which are like the five people who are closest to you, your immediate family, loved ones. Uh, the the second layer, your secondary relationships, so your your good friends and extended family, and the third layer, your sort of you you can either call it acquaintances mm -hmm. or you can call the the people on the periphery. As an introvert, I have far more people in that third tier on the mm. periphery. Yeah, than, I see that. than you do. You have way more people on the the second tier than I do. Yeah, like uh, I've got I've got a list of people who I never really got to develop relationships with in Missoula, yeah. and I remember thinking like, well, not even thinking it happened where. When I moved to Missoula, I, you know, had just call it five people that I was really close to. One would move away, and then I was like, "Oh yes, that means I could bring someone else in that right. I really wanted to get to know." Right. And like I, that list is still pretty long. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, so I would I would say, you know, if, saying, if Dunbar's yeah. number is 150, you probably have 100 people in that second tier. <laughs> I have 100 people, 130, 140 people in the third tier. Mm. Um, 
whereas I have very few secondary relationships. You're either really close to me or I can still call you a friend and we can hang out once or twice a year, but that's that, that's pretty much it for me. I, yeah. I prioritize my, my time alone first. But when I did want to spend time with people, I just didn't have that community of people in Missoula. It doesn't mean they're wrong or I'm wrong. It just there wasn't it was a puzzle piece that didn't fit for yeah, me. Yeah, the one thing that you said that stands out to me is is preferences. Yes. And like that's I think that's what it comes down to. Cuz you know, going back to that introvert who lives in a cabin in the middle of nowhere in Alaska mm-hmm. who would never live in New York, right. well, vice versa. Like someone in New York may never ever want to go out and live in that cabin in the middle of nowhere. Exactly. And it all comes down to preferences. Yes, absolutely does. So, so I think when we're talking to when we're talking to, to Sarah here, she had two questions. One is about the location she feels drained. I don't think it's the location that's draining her necessarily. It might be, but I think it's her profession that is draining her. Hmm. And and it might mean that you have to figure out what your mission is what's the actual mission and then how do you fulfill that based on your preferences or your personality and yeah. it might mean that you're helping children by writing textbooks or children's books yeah uh, and that you you're spending most of your time alone in doing that or it might mean that you have to find a way to mentor students one-on-one mm-hmm. because I, with someone like me i'm much better one-on-one whenever we go out as a group like it's really difficult for me to like i get overwhelmed yeah. But if we just have a sit down one on one, in fact, Bex noticed this the other day. Me, you, and Mariah and Bex all went out to dinner, right? Mm-hmm. The four of us yes. went over to, to Kaya. Yes. And, and after Bex goes, you and Ryan are the only two people I know who can just talk together forever. <laughs> and it's because I have a. Uh, I, I mean, I can't even do that with Bex the way that I, I do it with you. It's because we know we've just known each other for so long. Exactly, and we know what the other person is going to say before they say it quite often. Yeah, and we can ba- we have callbacks and little inside jokes that are only funny to us, <laughs> but we think they're really funny. Yeah, yeah, we we we're, we swear we're the most hilarious people on earth. But uh, how many and, times you got to talk about it doing a joke like with the podcast or something, and you're yeah. like, dude, there's only two people who would find that joke funny. It's so hyper specific. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and uh, and so like you're like, hey, what about Mrs. Cordini? And I'm like, they're not gonna get that on the podcast. <laughs> right. um, anyway, shout out to Mrs. Cordini. Eighth yeah. Grade. Um, and uh, so so what I what I learned about you and I is like I'm so much better. Even when like the four of us were together, it was sort of like you and I siphoned ourselves off, and we just had a conversation because it's so much easier for me to do that. Mm. You do just as well or maybe even better amongst a group of people, mm. uh, especially people you don't know. For me, like I would just like, I want to leave immediately. Yeah. So I mean, getting back to Sarah here though, she did sound, I mean, to me, she sounded not that she really liked her profession, but that she was excited about her profession. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it's funny, you, you were saying maybe it's a profession, not the city. When I think about living in New York City, it's... I get drained yes. just thinking about I it. I agree. I agree with that. Oh, New York seems overwhelming to me. And most, like a lot of people who I talk to who live in New York, the biggest complaint that I hear mm-hmm. is how much you have to work in order to, to afford to live there. Yeah. So that that could be a piece of it for, for Sarah here. Well, that's the having to versus want, getting to, right? Yeah. And so it's like it, uh, the, the change thing where it's like, you may want a change and you then you accept it, but if you're forced into working overtime just to pay the rent yeah. in a roach infested well, New dude, York apartment. Perfect example is, you know, we would work, you know, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty hour work weeks. Yeah. Um we there are some weeks where we will work fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty hour work weeks. Uh huh. Um it's definitely far and few between. You're saying then versus now. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, then versus now. So like now it's like we choose to do it. Right. Like you're, you're absolutely right. Like if you were to tell me, all right, Ryan, all right, dude, like in order to make this work, we have to work 80 hours a week from now on. I would be like, dude, like we have to reconsider. <laughs> but you know, if we are on tour, uh-huh. you know, I mean, when we're on tour, I mean, we're pretty much working all, you know, all day. We get to sleep at night and, yeah. and uh, you know, 75% of the nights we get, you know, eight hours, uh, a chance to sleep eight hours, but 25% right. we don't. Right. Um, but it is much different, like choosing to do that uh, rather than like, yeah, yeah, just like having that 
being forced into well, it. Be, totally yeah, being, being in control is, yeah. is, is part of it. And right now, it sounds to me like what Sarah is dealing with, she feels like she's not in control. And that's right. why she feels depleted. So there, there's a good kind of tired and a bad kind of tired, mm -hmm. right? You go to the gym and you work out really hard. Nicodemus lifts all the weights. All of them. And then afterward... They got to bring weights in from the back. <laughs> <laughs> afterward, though, you feel like a good kind of tired. You, you feel exhausted, uh, but in a good way. Yeah. Now, she feels depleted in a bad way yeah and where she doesn't feel like she has uh the adequate time for for recharging now if you leave the gym you're like i'm exhausted i'm gonna come back in 40 minutes well all of a sudden it's gonna be like then th that doesn't feel good you're gonna feel depleted but when you come back 40 minutes later you're like i have to lift these weights again mm -hmm. and so there's also that time for recovery and that's why i suspect she's an introvert i feel like she's not getting enough time alone to recharge on her own mm -hmm. and then it, that leads into her second question she says well then i i feel like i'm oversimplifying right i mm -hmm. uh I, I, do i ever get there do i ever get to this minimalist life 